everybody. We're going to get started right at the top of the hour, so just about another minute. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Data Architecture Virtual Group Meeting for February 2019. Today, we are very happy to have Tim Radney from SQL Skills here, here to talk to us about Azure SQL Database for the Production DBA. My name is Kenny Neal. I'm the co-leader of the chapter, along with my, my friend Rob Canzanari. Uh, you can see Rob's email address there and both of our Twitter handles if you want to get in touch with us. Uh, like you may have seen in some earlier emails, we're looking to fill out some slots for this year. So if you have any talk that you'd like to give or a recommendation for a speaker, uh, get in contact with us, with us there, and we will do our best to make it happen. Uh, some upcoming sessions that we do have scheduled, we've got Mark Vandewile from HBR Software coming back next month. Uh, his talks are always very interesting. Uh, and then more SQL skills. We've got Jonathan and Glenn coming up later in the year, April and July, respectively. You can find information for those and anything else that we schedule at our website, datarc.pass.org, and you can register for everything and get reminded and get on our email list. Uh, we are sponsored uh, for the past two years now, I think, by Nutanix. Uh, we thank them for their support. And also, again, this year, sponsored by HVR Software. Uh, so please uh, thank our sponsors. They, they make it possible that we have a little bit of money to give away for the attendees. Uh, registration for Pass Summit 2019 is open. Uh, you definitely want to head out to Seattle and, and see it's the uh, best of the best as far as SQL conferences go. No offense, Tim. Uh, Rob and I will both be there this year. And then we are one of many uh, virtual groups. You can find a virtual group on just about any topic and in any language you can think of. Here's a handful of upcoming dates and sessions. Uh, Find out more about these from the PASS website, PASS.org. Upcoming SQL Saturdays, uh, you can see here some stuff that's coming up in the near future. And because I can, uh, Baton Rouge in August, even though that's not the very near future, our call for speakers is open. Please come down and see us. I know it's hot in August, but it's a great time. And with that, I don't have anything else to say, so I'm going to pass it over to Tim. Thank you very much. All right, Kenneth, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. All right, well, thank you everyone for connecting and giving up an, an hour, hour and a half uh, to continue your education. Today, we're gonna talk about Azure SQL Database for the production DBA. Uh, so we will cover a lot of things about Azure SQL Database. I'll mention things about you know the current on-premises of so SQL Server 2016, 2017, so you'll get some knowledge there as well. And I'll probably throw in a few things about a, a, a new environment called you know, Azure SQL Managed Instance. Uh, so we'll get moving on along. Uh, I am with SQL Skills. We, I get to work with an incredible group of people. So Paul Randall, Kimberly Tripp, Glenn Berry, Aaron Stellato, and Jonathan Cahayas. Uh, I mean, you, I, 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 I'm still in awe every time I, I log into email and I'm, I'm getting emails and, and instant messages from, from you know, this incredible team. Now what we do, so we do instructor-led training. These are known as our immersion events. So it's the in-person training. We also have uh, over 175 hours of content out on Pluralsight. And I have another slide about that. And then we do consulting and remote DBA. We speak at conferences. So we do speak at the past summit. You know, that's a, that is, uh, as Kenneth said, a, a very large, uh, it's kind of the largest SQL nerd herd uh, of, of a convention. I mean, uh, 4,000 plus people, I think on, on average, uh, lots and lots of sessions. And then the SQL intersection, which I have a slide on, is a, a smaller conference. It is focused on the entire stack. So Windows and .NET and uh, machine learning, Azure, SQL Server, uh, all encompassing conference. Um, and then if you're not a SQL Skills Insider, this is our newsletter. Paul sends it out every two weeks. It is full of useful SQL Server knowledge, what's going on with our team. Glenn Berry has a column in there about you know, the changes or updates in hardware. And then there's always a SQL Skills Insider video where we step through something neat or cool that we've come across uh, recently uh, to kind of share that knowledge. So make sure to sign up. 
our classes coming up. So we have classes in April and May in person in Chicago. I do have a four day uh, class on Azure covering everything from virtual machines, SQL database, managed instance, uh, a new course on Power BI. Now this is a, a different focus. So this is Power BI for the, the production DBA. You know, uh, not just the, the business intelligence or the data analytics person. If you are supporting SQL Server reporting services as a primary you know, DBA you know, developer, or kind of all things, how to get started, how to migrate, lift and shift from SSRS to Power BI, you know, from um, you know, building some basic reports to administering and dealing with the authentication and the configuration, that's what that session is going to be focused on. You can find out more at sqlskills.com. And I mentioned Pluralsight, if you email paul at sqlskills.com, if you're not a Pluralsight subscriber, he'll send you a code for 30 days of all SQL Skills content. So you have 30 days to try to cram in 175 hours of SQL Skills content. So good luck. Uh, lots of courses, everything from performance tuning to uh, Glenn Berry explaining how to use his DMVs, uh, Paul, his weight stats. I have courses on consolidation and of course, Azure. I mentioned the SQL intersection. You can save some money on your registration using the discount code RADNEY. We will be in uh, Orlando June 9th through the 14th, and then uh, sometime later in the year, we'll be back out in Vegas. We have uh, eight different workshops. So these are all day workshops, plus 40 separate sessions on SQL Server. And like I mentioned, the entire Dev Intersection Conference, this is the SQL intersection. So it's the SQL portion of the conference, but you sign up, you can kind of float in between uh, different portions of the conference. Um, so make sure to check that out. How to contact me, Tim at SQLSkills.com and Twitter at TRadney. And then I do a lot of stuff with uh, SQL community and farming. So there's that. So what are we going to cover from SQL Database or Azure SQL Database? First, we need to kind of discuss what is Azure SQL Database. We're going to talk about features. And then what I call unsupported features, it's really things that we're used to with SQL Server that you can't really do with Azure SQL Database. We'll talk about a tool called the DTU Calculator. And then we'll talk about different tuning differences and some options that we have. So basically, what is it? What do I get with it? And then how do I support it? So SQL Database in itself. This is your database as a service. We have a lot of as a service things out there. Your software as a service, infrastructure as a service. Um, it, so kind of think of this as a relational database engine that's out there providing you uh, kind of on-demand database services. What you get with it is predictable performance and pricing. You have a lot of different pricing models out there and you have guaranteed levels of compute. So whatever compute level that you need, you sign up for it, that's what you've, you've chosen. You're guaranteed that IO, that number of cores, that amount of DTU, whatever model that you've chosen. And then you can scale up and down as needed. We do have something called elastic database pools, and those are for more your unpredictable workloads, or if you have a lot of databases that you're managing. And we'll talk more about that throughout the, uh, the session. What is really cool is you have four nines of availability built in, and this is financially backed. This is their SLA. Four nines is, is a pretty solid amount of, of uptime. That's something like, um, what, 40 minutes a, a year? I mean, that's giving you just a couple of minutes a month for patching and, and things like that going on. Very few organizations can achieve that themselves. Uh, so this out of the box and from your basic tier all the way up to your top end premium. We also have something called geo-replication. This allows you to have, uh, readable secondaries in different Azure regions. And then we, the restore services also provide your data protection. And we'll talk more on the, the very next slide on the restore services. When Azure SQL Database came out, we didn't have to go and download any new you know, tool like uh, or a different version of SQL Server Management Studio to work. This is a, a data source. Your existing tools, libraries, APIs, they, they just work. And what is truly beneficial here compared to like an on-premises is the ability to easily scale up and scale down. So if you have different seasons, uh, think of like a, a florist, you know, what are their busiest days of the year? Well, one is coming up this week, that would be Valentine's Day, and then Mother's Day. So 
February and May are their busiest times and usually just the week of. Uh, so if you're running like a, a flower shop, you don't want to have to buy big, massive iron to run your, your website and your uh, cash register. Um, here you could scale up for those weeks and then scale back down. And that's true of all, just about everything in, in the Azure footprint. And then security and compliance, that's really kind of important here. If you're thinking of moving from on-premises to Azure, what does that look like? You know, what level of uh, compliance if you're in a, regula a regulated uh, type environment where you have examiners, regulators uh, that you know, come and do audits? You know, do you have to maintain PCI compliance, HIPAA, high tech, um, you know, any of those types of things? What are your options? And it is secure, and we'll we'll talk about that. So first, as a production DBA, when I first started looking at Azure SQL Database, as a a guy that was responsible for data assets for very large companies, I wanted to know what changes for me to be able to do backups and restores. You know, how do I do my backups? Where are my backups stored? And what I found out was you don't control your backups. Your backups are handled for you. You actually can't take a backup. You can export data out of an Azure SQL database. So I can go in and I can select or I could export data to your application and create a backpack file. And I could take that backpack and import it to another system. But I can't run a backup database uh, command to manually backup my, my database. So what we have is different retention periods based upon your level. So your basic is seven days, your standard and premium are 35 days. That also translates to your business critical and your general purpose tiers um, are uh, 35 days. What you are allowed is point in time restores. So at any point during your retention period, you can go back and restore to whatever date, time, minute uh, that, that you choose, which is pretty neat. I mean, that would be equivalent of you doing a full and differential and transaction logs with a stop at statement. Here you go, you choose your database, you click restore, you choose the date and then the, the time, and then it restores that database to a new database name. Now that is important to know. If you are paying per DTU or per vCore pricing and you restore a database, you've just created a new singleton database that you are gonna be paying for. Now it's not the end of the world because you're, you pay per hour that, it's, uh, uh, that the database is up and then you can you know, do whatever you need to do, get your data out, you know, insert into the existing database to uh, fix the oops situation. Or if you're restoring to a point in time and that's becoming the new database, then you can drop the old, rename the new, whatever your, your process is gonna be. But just know that if you're in a singleton state that you will start incurring additional billing if you uh, need to uh, do that restore. If you're in an elastic pool, then you're restoring that into your pool of resources. The only thing it's gonna do is count against your uh, database size limits and the number of databases. Now, if you need more than 35 days, there is the Azure, uh, it, names changed a couple of times, I think it's the Azure Data Vault um, or long-term uh, long um, retention that you can get up to 10 years of additional backups. So. Uh, from from there, I mean, you can you can keep up to ten years, and I I'd have to go look at the current documentation, but I think that's a, a monthly copy. Um, but you you can get um, more than those thirty five days. All right, features uh, from the security compliance, all of those things as Azure SQL Database was being kind of built in and kind of growing into its maturity, we had a lot of new features come out that we have now seen when they come to, um, uh, to SQL Server 2016. So if you're on 2016, you also have access to dynamic data masking, or I should say 2016 and up. So dynamic data masking is a, a pretty neat privacy feature. What it allows you to do is to create a rule set um, of how data in a column will appear in the result set. So there's no physical change to the data within the database engine. So let's say I have a count number. I don't want a count number to be showing the full account number when somebody runs a report or they're accessing uh, data within an application. I wanna mask that so it's all Xs or I'm only displaying the last few uh, digits of the account number or whatever that masking rule is that you want to apply. <clears throat> so you can create this dynamic uh, data masking rule 
and it applies to all users in the system except for those that you exclude. So it's all encompassing. So administrators are uh, um, exempt from the rule, and then you apply whatever Active Directory group or whatever role uh, that you want to be excluded. This is pretty impressive. Now, one of the, the challenges here is if your users have access to uh, filter the where clause of the data set, let's say that they're looking for uh, payroll. You know, that, that's always the example you know, people tend to use. So if someone wants to go and look up Tim Radney and in the, the employee table and try to see salary, well, if they can search salary or the, the employee table by last name, they can select star from uh, employee where last name equals Radney and they see a result set. Well, if part of the result says salary and it's all X's, well, they can't see that. Well, if they can query and say, select star from employee you know, table where last name equals Radney and salary greater than $10 an hour, then they could essentially keep modifying that where clause to find out you know, where the salary is you know, greater than or less than to narrow down to um, what the salary would be. Now, they don't actually ever see the full salary because it's masked, but you know, if they can filter, they can deduce uh, and, and still determine a close range or the exact if they have enough time. Most cases, though, the users don't have the ability to filter on what you're trying to mask. So the dynamic data masking function is an extremely valuable tool. Previously, uh, application engineers or developers had to try to control this within either an application layer or the DBAs are having to duplicate data and having a masking table and you know, getting some very complex things with views, stored procedures, different things to try to you know, mask sensitive data. So this allows you to do that. And at the same time, if, the, if a, a column or a, a data type is one that you feel that you need to be masking, it's also a field that you should also be wanting to audit. So, hey, you, nobody sh should be filtering on salary range of the employee table unless they're HR, right? So if you're starting to see those things and you're auditing, you, one, you're masking the data, two, you're auditing the data so you can see where anomalies are coming in. But this is a very uh, impressive um, you know, new feature that we have. Again, it's been around in Azure SQL Database. I want to say it went GA in like early to mid 2015, and we didn't see it in a box version until uh, summer of 2016 when SQL Server 2016 launched. You want to take that a step further, role level security. Now you can filter access to data based upon a user's identity. So let's say from you know, back on the employee thing, if your company employees are also customers, maybe you don't want you know, first level uh, you know, people to be able to look up employee level data. So I, I came out of finance. So let's say uh, the, the tellers at a bank, they don't need to be able to look at uh, you know, customer data where the customer is an employee. Maybe that needs to be a branch manager. So based upon their identity or their role, you could say they don't have access to query and see employee level data. So for purposes, let's say we have a million row table, 800,000 are external customer, 200,000 are employees. If a branch manager were to query that table, they would see all 1 million rows. However, a teller that's only allowed to see external customer, so they can't see where employee status equals one. If they queried that table, they would only see 800,000 rows. Very easy to configure and set up. Um, I've actually done insider videos on both of these. What is interesting and, and neat to know here and to think about is for dynamic data masking, you can choose to mask a numeric field with a random number. Don't. <laughs> um, some would call that fake news, dirty data, um, uh, bad data. So if I'm querying and looking at a numeric value and I get a random number, I may not know that that random number is made up. And if I'm in a situation where I'm looking at that report and making business decisions based upon that value, I just made a really bad decision. So if you're masking numbers, the best thing to do is to put X's in it. I mean, let the, the consumer of that data be able to visually tell that that is you know, not real data, that it's X'd out. Similarly with row level security, if they're not seeing the entire uh, picture, you know, all the data, and they're making a business decision, 
So I'm now only seeing 800,000 of the million rows and I'm trying to sum up you know, some value and I, I have incomplete data, I could be making bad decisions. So in that case, you need to you know, definitely let people know that data is being masked and that they're not allowed to see certain data uh, data sets. All right. Um, always encrypted. I, I really need to flip this in, in the slide deck because when I talk about always encrypted, I always bring up TDE first. So we'll fast forward. Transparent data encryption. This has been around since SQL Server 2008. And it, it was great to be able to check a box in your exam or for your examiners and, and audits and say uh, things and say that you're uh, encrypted at rest. And that's what it, it provides is real time encryption and decryption of your database. It, also your backups and your transaction log files as they sit on the disk. And it provided protection if somebody were to come into the data center and it, with a forklift and take the entire storage array that if they tried to, to you know, then mount that storage array if they didn't have the symmetric key they they can't mount and see those uh, your, your data files what it didn't protect against was someone being able to query the data and see the all the plain text data this is encryption at rest the database is online and somebody compromises a username password they have access they can still query and see all the data so microsoft has fixed that we now have always encrypted so always encrypted, again, it's an Azure SQL database, um, managed instance, SQL Server 2016 and above. This allows you to encrypt the data in the database engine. So think of a credit card number or uh, email address, uh, account numbers, um, any type of uh, medical data. You, you can now encrypt that in the engine and only those who have the encryption key can see the plain text data. Even you sysadmins, if you don't have the encryption key, you're not able to query and see that plain text data. So this takes us to a level of protection that we've never had before. And this is native now built into SQL Server. You can store your encryption keys in the Azure Key Vault. This is a very important thing when you start dealing with backup encryption, such as the, the SQL Server 2014 feature with native backup encryption. Now you're always encrypted is your key management. If you encrypt your data and then you have your backups and you don't have those keys and you lose your, your primary server and you're needing to restore those backups, you, you're in bad shape. You have a very large virtual doorstop. There, there's not a whole lot of help that anybody can provide. So you definitely wanna have proper key management and that is extremely simplified with using the Azure Key Vault. And what's nice with your Azure products, so in, in uh, Azure SQL Database, native uh, support there for the Azure Key Vault for always encrypted, as well as transparent data encryption. Now, we've covered your dynamic data masking, your role level security, your always encrypted, your transparent data encryption. There's also encryption in, in motion with TLS, transport layer um, uh, uh, encryption. So your data is secure from a, a regulatory Thing. There is the uh, Azure Trust Center. You can look that up and go and look and see how Microsoft achieves PCI compliance and the HIPAA high tech, everything that they've done to get those levels of requirement or the certifications uh, or compliance certifications from a data center perspective. So access controls to the data, to the systems from retina scan and all those types of things from you know, firewalls and seg segregating you know, different bits of the data. So from a systems perspective, it's secure, it's compliant. You as a consumer or, or we as consumers still have to maintain our side. So leveraging network security groups and the encryption processes and the auditing. Uh, so yes, you can still achieve PCI in Azure very easily. You just have to maintain uh, your portion, just like you have to do today on premises. It's just simplified because all the data center stuff is handled for you. So geo-replication, what is this? Uh, it's your readable secondary. Think of like an availability group or, um, yeah, I mean, it's really a transactional replication sort of. To me, it's more like an AG where it's a readable secondary. The latency is very low. It's available in all tiers and it's all active geo-replication. So you can have up to four secondaries you know, currently. So any database from a basic 
tier at $4.99 up to your top end you know, premium and business critical. Um, from, from that, I mean, you have the, the simplicity of choosing your database, going in and saying geo-replication, configure your server in another region. So every region has a preferred failover. If you're in the East US, it's gonna be West. If you're in the West, it'll be East. So whatever part of the world that you're in, you have a preferred failover. For that one, you're, you have the latencies uh, or the, the ERT, uh, recovery point of time, recovery point objective uh, guaranteed. So estimated recovery time less than 30 seconds with a recovery point objective uh, less than five seconds in your preferred you know, failover center or preferred region. You can set up the, the geo-replicated copy in any Azure region. So let's say I'm in the East US and I'm working for a company that their home office is in the UK and they need to be able to access uh, a bunch of Power BI reports or reporting services, you know, whatever. So they have reporting that want, they would like to point to the database. Instead of them coming across the wire, I could point them to a readable secondary sitting in uh, a, a UK region. Very simple to, to set up. Uh, you can also set up um, the automatic failover for the, the redirects. I mean, the technology is is all there where you can create fault domains. Um, incredible stuff. And what's it? what really shocked me was, let's say I'm in a, a standard tier, I can replicate, my secondary replica can be anywhere within that standard tier. So let's say my primary is an S4. My readable secondary could be an S4, could be an S0, could be an S12, I mean, it could be anywhere. So my secondary, if my read workload is more intense than my write workload, my secondary could be a higher tier than my primary. And that's all flexible. I can scale up, scale down as needed. Uh, someone asked, can you manually fill over to test your replication? Uh, yes, you can force a failover. All right, uh, Elastic Database Pools. This is a, a very valuable feature. Um, I, I've yet to come across a DBA that only supports a single database. We all have applications that have multiple databases. We have uh, systems that have, you know, or database instances that have multiple applications from different databases, uh, very, I mean, I, I can't think of a, a single instance where I've been teaching and ask who only supports a single database. So in this case, let's say you have a server that you're looking to move and that SQL instance has 10 databases from 10 different applications, or you have a, a database per customer that you need to migrate. In this case, you may not want to micromanage the amount of compute, so the amount of CPU, the amount of uh, disk I.O., the amount of memory at a per database level. We don't do that today with on-premises. We have an actual server, and then that server has total CPU, total disk I.O., and, and memory that all the databases on that instance kind of share and, and pull from. And that's essentially what an elastic pool is doing. You have a pool of resources. If you're in the vCore model, then it's a number of vCPUs, it's a, an amount of memory, and it's amount of you know, storage I.O. that's been configured. So this allows you to do that. So I'm no longer having to micromanage singleton databases and their uh, um, uh, compute levels. It's a pool of resources. Each database can pull from that pool as needed. And then I can also set limits. So maybe I don't want to allow uh, any databases to consume more than 200 DTUs or um, uh, whatever the, the, the level that you determine. So this simplifies your management for maintaining all the databases. And then let's say you do have one database that's just very, very noisy. It's that most intense. And if you wanted to evict it, so it had a guaranteed level of compute, you could still evict it out of the pool to be a singleton. I've been in situations where uh, customers have gone through and previously had been paying per database. You know, so they had a whole lot of singletons. And from migrating to an elastic pool, they were able to save around $4,000 a month in compute uh, expense. So this is something, if you're gonna be managing a handful of databases, then you want to uh, definitely look into an elastic pool. Now, someone was asking, is it possible to set a minimum resources per database? The minimum's already set, could be zero. I mean, 
it's you know maybe they they were asking about max so you you definitely can set max where they can't consume um, so we'll use the edtu model so if i had a pool of 2000 edtus i could say no database can consume more than 100 200 you know whatever level that that you want to set but from a minimum perspective it the the min zero i mean it can be a database sitting there doing nothing if anyone is using in memory oltp or aka hecaton it is supported in the premium tier and anytime i mention standard that's your uh, also your general purpose or premium is your business critical so the premium and business critical tier supports uh, in memory oltp query store uh, this one is kind of a, a source source subject at, at, at times you know, I'll ask when I'm presenting this and, you know, when I'm in person and have a, a room full of people, you know, hey, show of hands, who's on SQL Server 2016 or above? And, you know, nowadays a lot of hands go up. All right, how many of you are taking advantage of Query Store? And a, a few hands go up. And I ask those, okay, so those of you who did not raise your hand, you know, just kind of call out, why are you not leveraging Query Store? Most of the time, the answer is, I don't know how to use it. I, I don't know how to take advantage of it. I haven't had time to to work with it and learn it yet. Uh, a couple of people will say, well, I'm worried about the performance impact. And the, the best thing to respond there is there's been a lot of you know uh, updates to Query Store, you know, fixes and in, in different CUs. And there are ways of uh, modifying Query, to Query Store uh, to where it's you know not aggressive at all. And the other thing is, don't go turn it on on every single database on your instance all at the same time. I mean, what databases are your mission critical that you want to be able to have a, a dashboard of the query usage and runtime statistics and the associated plans and all those good things that Query Store captures? It probably isn't all 40 databases on an instance. You have a top two, top three. Uh, so I always encourage people to take a look at Aaron Stellato's uh, Pluralsight course on Query Store. It's just under three hours incredible information and she goes through a lot of scripts of how to digest the information what to do with it and then all the query store settings themselves in how you can optimize to change its polling its flushing the size of it um you know it's not a a a single you know you flip it on you flip it off it you can only do one thing there's a lot of knobs that you can uh, you know, turn and adjust for your environment so definitely take a look at her course and make sure that you start taking advantage of this. Now in Azure, for Azure SQL Database, and I should have mentioned this with TDE as well, it is on by default. So for TDE, for Azure SQL Database, when you create a new database, transparent data encryption is on by default. You can go turn it off. Similarly with Query Store, back in October of 2017, I believe it was, they started uh, setting all new databases where Query Store is on uh, by default. You can go and turn it off, but then you lose access to things like Query Performance Insight and a lot of the other dashboards for looking at uh, Query Performance um, within the, the built-in monitoring tools. So for on-premises and Azure SQL Managed Instance, you have to enable this. So it's not there by default. Kind of tying into Query Store, we have Index Advisor. Now, this is an area that production DBAs start getting a little uh, kind of antsy and, and concerned. So, so far as a production DBA, the, the feature sets that we've talked about, the only thing that would change with your job if you moved everything to Azure SQL Database is you're no longer responsible for installing SQL Server and configuring it and taking backups. So very few of you, that's probably your, your only job is installing and configuring SQL and managing backups. So pretty safe. I mean, that's what maybe an, an hour a month if you're if you're building a, a lot of SQL uh, or a lot of new instances or maybe some upgrade project, but it's minimal impact right now. Index Advisor is, is a bit more scary. So this is providing index recommendations that have potential to improve the overall workload of your, your instance, of your, your database. This is not missing index DMV. This is not the uh, database tuning advisor. This is tru truly analyzing the workload and evaluating if this index would improve performance of your, your database. You can't 
trick this. It's not like in, uh, when you look at the execution plan and you run a query one time, it says, hey, here's a missing index. It is truly looking at the workload and it takes a while to even get a index recommendation from Index Advisor trying to demo it. I mean, I have to have scripts running for hours and hours before it will make a recommendation. So from this, Index Advisor will make recommendations for creating indexes, for dropping indexes. Um, also, you can enable the force plan. So if you have a query that's generating multiple execution plans, so you have plan regression, you can tell it to automatically force plan on the, the most efficient version. So the, the, the plan that has the, the least impact or the better, better performance for the overall workload. The drop index freaks people out from time to time. They're, what, they're like, what about uh, these indexes I have for month end reporting? Or these indexes I have for quarter end reporting? The drop index, the index has to be unused or a duplicate index before it will make a recommendation. And for the, the unused, it's after, I have to go back and look, it's either 93 or 95 days. It's 90 plus, I, I can't remember if it's a three or a five, have that documented somewhere, um, but not in the slide deck in my notes. So from that, I mean, that eliminates the whole month end and quarter end unused index. I, I had somebody in a class ask, well, what about year end? I'm like, we should talk after the session, but for year end, those, those indexes shouldn't be in there why are you maintaining indexes for 360 plus days where they're not being consumed or used drop them and sometime in mid-december or whatever your your fiscal year end recreate them there's no use in having all that overhead for this the space every insert update delete that's got to be maintained for those year-end indexes month end okay i can understand even quarter end to to a degree um, but again, the, the drop recommendation, you can feel safe that it's not going to just go and arbitrarily drop indexes that haven't been touched in you know, less than, than 90 days. So people or, or DBAs, when they hear that this is an automatic feature, you can have it auto do this stuff. You can have it just make recommendations. You can have it inherit from your uh, the, the parent, you know, the, the SQL server or the container. But in an auto type situation, they're like, well, you know, that that's my job. I'm like, okay, well, how many of you are proactively every day, you come in the office and look, all right, today I'm going to find five queries to tune. My, my top five worst performing queries I'm going after, and I'm proactively looking to try to tune systems. I've had two out of maybe 500 people that I've talked in front of that would raise their hand that say, yes, I, I do this on a daily basis. I'm proactively tuning. The rest of us, I mean, it's only when we get a phone call, hey, the system's running slow or everyone in you know, the war room, we're having to try to troubleshoot. If you are able to actively and, and proactively, we're, we're going after these things when there's a problem. The rest of the time we're working projects and requests and, and other type situations, looking at failed jobs, rolling code, uh, doing diff different bits in our, our day to day. So this will just, you know, it, if you enable this, well, maybe to help prevent a few of those war room situations for you know, catching things as, as they roll. Um, and I do share with people, you don't have to have it enabled, but you, you definitely wanna be notified if a recommendation is made. And with that recommendation, you can go do your own homework, you know, troubleshoot, evaluate, take a look at it. It does give you some cool things, you know, whether it's you know, high, uh, mid-level or, or low recommendation, how much space is projected that this is going to take. If you enable the auto, I mean, it creates the index. If it sees that it doesn't have the improvement that it thought, it will revert back. It will not create the index if you're under load. So if you're already under pressure and it sees that it needs this index, it won't add additional pressure and put you in a dangerous place by creating the index. If it's going to, you know, if you're over a certain percentage of uh, DTU or, or CPU consumption, so we'll sit there, we'll wait a period of time, check again. If, if you fall under that threshold, it will create it. So it does a lot of mat mature you know, analytics um, to, to not put your system in, in more jeopardy. And if the drop, uh, you know, uh, the, the drop also has a situation where if it didn't you know, reclaim the, the space and, and do you know, certain levels of things, it would, would also revert. 
So it's a pretty safe feature. I haven't had anyone that's had this enabled that went back and, and turned it off for any particular reason. Uh, but I do have you know lots of customers with it enabled. And then I have the handful that they want to see it in and take credit because that's the other thing that you can do is just change the name of the index from the the default uh, I think it's NCI for non clustered index underscore WI for uh, or WA for Washington um, so you, you can choose the proper naming convention all right so that's a lot of the things that are new and uh, to Azure SQL database uh, again a lot of these features make it into the box version eventually um, You'll, you'll notice a trend, it's Azure first. So that's that's one of the good things too, is Azure SQL Database. There's millions of, of production databases out there and that's kind of our, our test bed. So new features come out, they're in private preview, then they go public preview, then they go GA, and then some of them that can then make it into the box version, known as SQL Server 2016, 17, SQL Server 2019. So that's one of the good things. So when we finally sit in the box version, we know it's pretty well, you know, tested and validated. But what are things that we're used to that we can't do in SQL DB? Well, there's no SQL Server agent. That's kind of a big thing for many organizations because we have jobs that are running to do various data cleanups and and whatever, you know, maybe kicking off an ETL process or, or doing something. How do we circumvent this? Well, there are Azure features, Azure products, that's Azure Automation and Elastic Jobs. I think Elastic Jobs is now called Elastic Agent and you know, PowerShell. You can also use SQL Server Agent on-premises. You know, uh, so SQL Server uh, Agent running on a, a on-premises SQL Server or on an Azure Virtual Machine. Now, most of my customers all still have an Azure VM running a, a, a standard edition or so of, of SQL you know, SQL Server, they had you know, extra license they're able to use or, or reclaim or, uh, but they, they kind of use that as their jump box. And that's where they'll have Management Studio installed and they can connect to their SQL databases and other SQL servers and kind of do their thing. And so they'll set up some automation or their maintenance tasks there for their Azure SQL databases. And that works really well. It's something they're used to. The Azure automation is a service. And with that, you can do anything within Azure. If you need to schedule spinning up a development environment or QA and then tearing it down and pretty much doing anything. That's kind of your, your agent, your, your um, scheduler you know, in the cloud. Anyone that has like a, a BMC Control M, I mean, this is your, your enterprise scheduling tool for Azure everything is the um, Azure automation. It uses runbooks, so that's a really nice thing for those of us that don't like writing PowerShell from, from scratch. Um, the, the runbooks, you hey, this is what I need to do. Go grab that runbook, modify it with your information and, and your schedule, and, and let it go. So it works really well. But the number one thing that is kind of a showstopper is there's no cross-database query support. So if you have an application that has multiple databases, and those databases talk to each other, that's not really a good candidate for an Azure SQL database migration. Where Azure SQL DB it excels and does things that it really sets itself apart is the database level containment. There is no cross database query support. So if you have a client database or a tenant database per customer and you need that level of security, SQL DB is, is your product. So now you're not having to work or, or worry about the levels of permissions and, um, and roles and everything on an instance and have any cross database talk. That is all kind of sequestered. You have that built in protection in SQL database. So people have asked when managed instance came out, is that gonna kill SQL database? No, <laughs> they're different products to serve different needs. If I need database level containment, and there's a lot of SaaS vendors out there, and this is a, a huge selling point for them, and that's why they're, they're coming here in droves, that's what you need. But if I have multiple databases for an application, then I need SQL Server. I need instance level uh, manageability. And that's where Azure SQL Managed Instances come in. So SQL DBs, database scoped, managed instances, instance scoped. So, Carrying on, there's no database mail. So again, you can still leverage on-premises or an Azure VM. This is not really a, a big showstopper. I've, I've had a customer that had um, uh, a, a, a 
service, you know, they're, they're basically just pulling a directory or a, a, a table. If a certain condition exists, they need to get an email because then they have to go do something to, to, to fix something. Um, so it's just kind of a, a notification service for them. They're still able to run ABSML on premises or on an Azure, system, send whatever notifications that they want. A SQL database on the back end, it's just the data source. So you can link server to it. You can uh, connect to it through ADO. I mean, all your connection strings are, are there. So whatever service that you need to use to communicate with the SQL database, it's just like any other SQL database data source. So it works pretty well. Uh, events, event notifications, query notifications, SQL Server Trace Profiler. Uh, you can't set up trace flags. There's not a, a SQL Server integration services or, or reporting services out of the box like we have with on-premises. But there is Power BI and Azure Data Factory. And you can still leverage IS, uh, IS and RS on a VM or on-premises and pointing to SQL database. You can't log ship or mirror to SQL database, but you can use transaction replication where SQL database is a subscriber, but it cannot be a publisher. And then there's there's more, but from a production DBA, these were the, the big gotchas. Somebody asked about service broker. Um, I don't think that is still an option for SQL database, but it is for managed instance. So all of these things that I just mentioned, so database mail support, event notifications, um, um, the cross database query support, SQL Server agent is supported in a Azure SQL Manage instance. So that's where you get instance level uh, look and feel. There still isn't built in ISRS you know, for Azure. I mean, you again, Azure VM or uh, Power BI and Azure Data Factory. Uh, and I know CLR support and service broker and all those things are, are there for MI as well. If, if people are interested in a managed instance talk, uh, reach out to uh, Kenneth or Rob, and we can schedule that. I have another 60 minute to, to up to 90 minute session for for managed instance. So let's take a look at how to create an Azure SQL database real quick, and then we'll step through the DTU calculator, and then we'll come back and talk about some tuning. All right, let me get my virtual machine up. All right, so for the uh, DTU Calculator, we'll, we'll kind of start there. There's a website that's called dtucalculator.azurewebsites.net. And from here, there's a couple of tabs here in the middle. So you have Azure SQL Database and then Elastic Databases. It really doesn't matter which one you're on uh, at first to be able to get the script because it's the same program to run, whether it's a self-contained uh, executable or a PowerShell script, same script to collect the data uh, for both SQL database and uh, the Elastic Pool. What it's going to do is it's going to capture your percent processor time, your logical disk reads writes per second, and the log bytes flushed. So those are just performance counters uh, that it will get through uh, you know, Perfmon. And you have, this is where you can download the command line utility or PowerShell. And when you're done, then you'll upload the, the file that's uh, collected. And I'll show you that. But then you'll specify here how many cores you know, we're on that system. I've already done a couple of data collections. I have one from a 2V CPU, 4, and an 8. And then you'll browse out to your file. And so this is the 8. And then you'll click Calculate. While that's running, it's really quick. I want to come back over and show you uh, the process itself. So I have a couple of files that have already been collected. I'll delete those. This is the configuration file for the executable. And you see it's the process counters that it's grabbing, the, the percent processor disk reads writes. Here you can set how long it's gonna run. It defaults to 3600, which is 60 minutes. So this is in seconds. And then where you're gonna output the files. So I just have mine going to C, Azure, DTU, Calc. What I like about the executable is no matter how many times I run it, the file name is unique every time because it's down to the, the year, month, date, hour, seconds and then microseconds. So I'm just clicking on it several times. And you can see here, it's the same 2019, February 13th. It's uh, 248, 26 seconds, 30 seconds, 35 seconds. So even though I'm clicking on it very rapidly, it's a different file each time. So I can have this running from, or called from SQL Agent or Windows Task Scheduler. Maybe I have it running for an, an hour, four hours, whatever. So every four hours it kicks off and collects another data set. And you can see from the file itself, there's nothing 
uh, sensitive here. It doesn't even have server name listed in it. So it's just your column headers and then perfmon data. So the time and then uh, the disk percent processor, disk reads, writes, and log bytes flushed. So you should not have any issues uploading this to, um, to the website. So here we can see this is recommending a standard S7. It says that 100% of the workload will fit there. I can scroll down and see the DTUs over time. And from here, it's a P4, you know, P6. So this, the, the calculation here, when uh, the, the process was written, the standard tier only went up to an S4 or S3, which was 100 DTUs. It now goes up to 3,000. So the calculators at the top is making the, the proper recommendation, but then your graph here, you know, it's saying in the P's, and that's probably driven strictly from CPU, not from disk. So your standard tier is your little bit slower disk. Your premium is uh, local SSDs, not the remote SSD. So you have a lot more, I mean, exponentially faster storage in the premium tier. So we can see here standard, uh, uh, the S6 for CPU, for the IOPS, still an S6. A log uh, drops down to a basic. So my transaction log is you know, that, that basic tier, which is $4.99. So we can see overall, you know, from the, the graph here, the service tier level of percent, you know, the standards down at the bottom, and what percentage uh, kind of fits in based upon log and CPU and so forth. So it's kind of a neat graph just to be able to go geek out on your data sets, just to see, are you CPU bound? Are you IO? Um, kind of what's going on there. So let's take a look at my dashboard. And from here, if I wanted to create a new database, I could cl click on create a resource and then go and choose database um, databases. And I have options from manage instance, SQL database, data warehouse, MySQL, Postgres, lots of options. I could click on SQL database, and then I could enter the database name, my subscription, how am I gonna pay for it, my resource group, the source, is it a blank database, is it AdventureWorks, or is it from an existing Azure SQL database backup? Uh, do I wanna put it in a pool? Which server do I wanna put it on? And then my pricing, and then I can choose correlation. From pricing, I, I wanna just kind of point out, you do have your basic, your standard, your premium, and then you get over into the vCore options. So from V cores, I have general purpose, so Gen 4, Gen 5. I can get over to the business critical, which also has Gen 4, Gen 5. There's a, another option again, which is hyperscale. So you can see the IOPS uh, latencies and you know, up to 200,000 IOPS in your hyperscale and business critical, up to 7,000 IOPS in your general purpose. This is where I'm saying from general purpose to your standard premium, the disk IO is orders of magnitude faster in your business critical and your, your, your premium tier. So from here, I'll just choose basic. I'll say apply. And I could give this a name. So data arc, it likes that um, part of a pool no. And I could say create, and it would go create this database. From SQL Server Management Studio, um, I'll collapse this one here. I'll go to databases. I can right click and choose new database. And then it's gonna think, hopefully my connection's pretty decent from this VM uh, up to the cloud. And I can, again, specify the name. I can specify the tier. I can specify how much I'm gonna pay for it within the tier. And then uh, that's, that's about it. What you don't have are options of where am I putting my files? What are my auto growth? Uh, the number of data files. You know, any of that stuff, I get to name it and say how much I'm going to pay for it and choose my correlation. Now, from here, depending on your version of Management Studio, you can also go and specify various database level options. So your scoped configuration options. So legacy cardinality, uh, parameter sniffing, you know, maxed up. You know, some are grayed out, some allow you uh, to, to make the changes uh, based upon SQL DB's support of the um, uh, correlation. I mean, uh, the, the scope, config, scope configuration can also change your compatibility level. This was updated, I think, back in 2017, 2016, 2017. So now you can set compatibility. So if your vendor says we support Compat 100 or 
you know, 120. Regardless if it's Azure SQL Database or on-premises, if they've specified at the compat level, then you should feel comfortable that you can migrate that database. Uh, similarly with managed instance as well. All right, so we created a database, we showed the um, DTU calc. So we'll go back to the slides. So tuning, so instance level settings, things that you can't change. You can look at, you can see that there's a temp DB, but you can't modify anything with it. You can look at sys configurations and see what your cost threshold, max dot, uh, all those levels are, but there's no way of changing. So you can't uh, configure your max degree of parallelism, cost threshold for parallelism, min max server memory, your optimized for ad hoc workloads. Basically anything used, uh, that requires SP configure and reconfigure is off limits. Now, you also can't run DBCC free proc cache. Technically, I mean, free proc cache would be at the server level. So there is altered database scope, conf scope configuration free procedure cache. So that will free the procedure cache per database. So that's a, a per database option. You now you can go in and uh, part of my demo, I show uh, trying to do that, trying to run free proc cache and it doesn't. And I look at what are my top queries based upon execution count. And then I'll alter database scope configuration, free the procedure cache, and you'll still see some noise in there, but that noise is at the uh, the server level, you know, at my container, not database. So it's kind of a neat thing to start getting into scope configuration settings per DB. So allowing you to change things at a database level without having to impact the entire instance. So that's something that you, from 2016 and up, you really need to start uh, kind of looking into. So the, the pricing here, I think everything's still valid on the, um, the DTU levels, but there's been a, a recent update. And for most of my slides, I, I need to, on this as well, is just trash the, the pricing slides because it, it, a lot of it's changed. So we now have, uh, it's more of the, the vCore, your standard. I mean, you can see from basic up to your S12s increases and you have granularity now if you need to increase past the 250 gig uh, initial limit for your standard tier, you can get up to a terabyte. And then for your premium tier, uh, you can get up to a P15, 4,000 DTUs, and uh, a cost up to, or just under $16,000 uh, a month. Now that's a very large, very powerful uh, instance there. And from an elastic pool, your pricing is, is pretty much the same for those pools. With the introduction of the vCore pricing, uh, and we had a, a thing on Twitter going the other day about you know, is DTU dead? Is it going to stay? And DTU was kind of complicated because it's that blended level or measure of compute from CPU, memory, and disk. And it it's worked for some customers. I mean, we've they they've kind of grasped and and understood and became accepted. But it's difficult to try to measure DTU from what we're used to with number of vCPUs, amount of memory and, and disk. So when Managed Instance came out and went uh, public preview, vCore was introduced in preview for SQL DB. But what this also allowed is the conversion of on-premises license to SQL database. Because prior just with the DTU, if I had a standard edition instance with eight, say I have eight cores that I've licensed, and then I move that into DTU, I still own those eight licenses, and I'm paying for a, a built-in license in the DTU model. So what do I do with those eight v CPU license or eight core license that that was all of my workload? I, I'm just out. So now that would be a one-to-one, -one, so a standard edition license to one vCore general purpose. So that customer could have moved to an eight vCore pool for license that they already owned. Now. If you have enterprise edition, it's one enterprise core to four vCore general purpose. Managed instance, they start at eight vCore right now. That can change in the future. So right now, an uh, eight standard edition license would be one general purpose managed instance or two enterprise is one general purpose managed instance. You can read all about this. It is extremely fair. I mean, I've done a couple of unofficial polls on the, the oversubscription, you know, for number of vCPU per physical core uh, type thing. And for the most part, except for the, the couple of outliers that are doing something like five vCPU to one physical core kind of allocation, most people are 
are 50% over allocated on a logical processor. Anyways, I digress. It's a, it's a fair model and you can do the math for your organization. And I joke a lot and say that pretty much everything in, in, in SQL when it comes to licensing and things is, is just a math problem. You have to, you have to figure it out. Um, but if you need help, reach out and, and I can work with you on that. So from tuning with minor changes, your existing scripts work. I mean, I've used Paul Randall's foul statistics and weight statistics scripts for many, many years before joining SQL skills. And his file stat script reference sys master files. It doesn't exist, so I just modified it to use sys databases and it works perfectly. Now, the thing with the file stats is that's cumulative data. So this is how long has your SQL database been up and running? You, so you, you really need a better baseline. I don't wanna look and see, oh, my file stats over the past nine months has been X. I need to know from two to three every day, what, what are my latencies to know whether you know, I'm having a problem today or is it, is it just as bad today as it was last week? So I wanna uh, capture those over time and I wanna persist those to a table. So I can query this from another system. I can drop it into a, a, a table in that database. You, you have options. Similarly, weight stats. Paul's weight stat script, you know, his, uh, he has a pretty infamous post out there, weight statistics or please tell me where it hurts. And he has a script that kind of filters out all the benign weights. I mean, the weights that are just there, they're gonna be collecting, they're, they're you know, pretty much harmless. So I didn't wanna to have to reinvent that. So looking at his script, his script works beautifully as is, and it queries SysDM OS wait stats. The problem with SQL database is that's the container. Everything's at a database level. So we have a brand new DMV, SysDM DB wait stats. So if you're chasing and you're looking at weights at the container level and, and trying to find what's causing what your database is waiting on, you're looking in the wrong spot. So you need to modify his script from SysDM OS to SysDM DB. That's the only change you have to make and, and it works. Similarly with the weights over time. And again, that's something that you want to be capturing in a baseline. So I documented all of this in a SQL performance article that you can get. And then hopefully you're, you've been using Glenn Berry's DMVs for all versions of SQL Server. There's a bucket of scripts out there for SQL database as well. And we'll probably soon have some stuff out there for Azure SQL Managed Instance, because there's a whole nother uh, set of DMVs on weight statistics and other things for managed instance that takes things to a, a, another level that hopefully we'll see in, in, in the box version soon. All right, I've got a quick demo for the performance tuning, and then we'll come back and say, hey, this is all the good stuff that we covered and kind of wrap things up. So just kind of quickly you know, in here from the Azure portal, I'll go back to my dashboard and I have a, a pinned database here. And I don't know if something you know died with my workload or if just the, nope, looks like it's still up and running. All right, so I had a period of time, I shut down my virtual machine. Uh, I can go and look at, um, you know, say the last 48 hours, I can say apply. And if somebody called in and said, hey, the system was just really, really slow, couldn't even get connected to it yesterday or last night, be like, uh, yeah, looks like uh, around 11 something you know, last night until about an hour before the session, the, the, the system was offline. My VM went down and I, I didn't pay attention. I rebooted, I got a Windows patch and uh, it didn't all start back up. So you can see I've been driving a pretty consistent workload to the SQL database. If I wanna look and see kind of what's going on, uh, from a, a database perspective, I can click on, uh, I keep going into the wrong thing. It's my AdventureWorks 2014 database. So I can click there. And again, I see the dashboard for the past hour right here. So I've been driving a, a decent workload. The graph just, just kind of drop off into the, the near future because it's just not updating real time like it used to. But I can click here, drill in, and I get into metrics. And from here, I can you know, go through and uh, where we were just at, change the graph, look at different things. If I go back, I have performance overview. If I click on the performance overview, it's gonna show me more of the queries that are running. And each query ID has a different color for the top five. And you can modify this and look at based upon CPU, by disk, by log IO. And mine's all 
CPU driven. If I click on data, it all goes away. Log, it all goes away. Um, but back on CPU, I can see the graphs and then I get the query ID at the bottom. If I click on that top query, I'm gonna see the SQL text and then uh, some aggregate information and just kind of be able to drill in and look at kind of what's going on. And if there were recommendations, which usually this will have a recommendation and will tell me that I need an index created because this isn't optimized. I do have a purple graph over here telling me, hey, there are perfor uh, performance recommendations. If I click there, it's telling me that there's a, a low drop index. It's a duplicate index. But this index here is what is really, what it's really needing to make that yellow query go away. And this is a, uh, a non-clustered index on the sales order detail ID column. Um, this is all great. I mean, it's providing information. It's built in. I'm not having to pay for, for these graphs. This is all coming from Query Store. But old school, how would we do this? We'd connect into the system and we'd start looking at something like, you know, what are my, my top uh, queries? You know, what is it waiting on? You know, those types of things. So from here, I'm gonna get the use counts of the queries. And this could be based on CPU, could be based on, on whatever. And so I have just some noise, the set exact abort off. But then here's that query that we just saw that was that yellow query. So I'm selecting sales order ID, sales order detail ID from Adventure, the AdventureWorks sales order detail big, where a column equals a value. Well, that's this query right here. So if I take a look at the execution plan for this query, I just, I deleted a bunch of rows to try to make this a little faster. I had about 4 billion rows, dropped it to two and a half million. Um, it, it's gonna come back. I can then look and see what the estimated circuitry cost is. I can see exactly what's going on. So I'm returning 21 rows. It's a table scan. And if I look at it, I can see that the estimated subtree cost is 30.13, but I'm reading two and a half million rows to return 21. So this is just a, a simple, I need a, a covering index or I need a, a non-clustered index. So I'm gonna create that index. While this is creating, it's gonna take about a minute. I wanna show you a couple of other things here in uh, the, the Azure portal. I, I talked about how easy it is to do the geo replication. So that's a neat thing to look at. So from here, we can click on geo replication and then it shows us the, the world map. I wish it was a little bit bigger. You can see the blue and then over to the left, we see the little purple, that's the preferred failover site. It's the one that, that it's recommending for the US East, which would be US West. I could choose any of them. So I could go down to uh, Australia. I could go over in Asia, over into Europe, Canada, wherever I wanna go. So if I choose one, let's say we want to go to uh, France Central. All it's going to ask me to provide is the target server, the secondary type, readable, that's your only option. It's kind of locked out. You can see all these things are locked. Uh, I create a server and we'll just call it um, Radney French. Give it a username. Got to give it a password. It's got to be like a, th a thousand characters long. You got to type it twice successfully. We'll say select. So now it's going to go and create that server. Then what I want, you know, the pricing tier, uh, and then the standard. And this is where I was saying I can go anywhere within that standard tier, but I'm going to keep it inexpensive. So $18.75 a month. I say OK. And then boom. It just submitted and we are gonna geo replicate this database and you can see the little ants going across the screen. After a few minutes, this uh, couple of hundred meg database will be replicated and then this line goes solid to show that I am actively replicating to the France central region. And then once it's done, I could connect to that server after I create a firewall rule and start querying the data uh, in that system. All right, so we created our index. We're gonna run the same select statement. It was really, really fast. We have an index seek. So now we're scanning 21 rows or reading 21 to return 21. And our estimated subtree cost dropped from 30 to 0.003. Now, 
there, there was no difference here from how you go and troubleshoot where you're looking, maybe running Atom Mechanics SP who is active, or you're running a third party tool looking at high cost you know, queries, you're looking at query store, uh, you're just running Glenn scripts, you know, whatever your method for finding what's causing the pain, and then you dig in, start looking at execution plan, none of that changes. I mean, if anything, it's more critical in an Azure SQL database. Now, I had mentioned, you know, when I run this and looking at use counts, that we see a bunch of noise. And so we see, you know, 100, 100, 000, yeah, a couple of hundred thousands, 50 thousands, 27 thousands. You know, if I come up here and I try to free the procedure cache, I told you it will blow up. It tells me user DBO does not have permissions, but I can alter database script configuration, clear procedure cache. That is successful. So now if I query the kind of the buffer pool again and I look, those top 100,000s, 50,000s you know, are gone. And this is tempdb. So this is at the container level. So this is all that stuff I was saying is at the server level that you can't flush, you can't clear um, when you're in the database. So that's what dbcc free proc cache would have nuked that uh, retains because it's in query store. Or I mean, uh, it's, it's not the particular database. So you can, free cache per database. Uh, one other thing with query store is it is persisted in the database. So your on-premises servers, let's say you have a production, you restore that production database to dev or to QA, your query store data is, is built into the, I mean, it's metadata within the database. So you still have that. So that's a really nice thing with trying to troubleshoot. So you wanna bring that production database down to dev, you wanna query query store, see what's going on. Maybe you create a few indexes, you wanna replay a workload, I mean, all of that is, is there for you. Um, and again, Erin covers a lot of that in her, her course. So this was a, a simplified um, uh, demo here. I do have Sentry 1 kind of running, capturing stuff because uh, it's more responsive than uh, the built-in tools. I mean, the refresh rate. And you can see where I came in here, then I created the index. So you see there's a lot of additional IO here, not just CPU, so from disk, and then it just falls off. So the workload that I've been running nonstop for the past hour, I mean, just the, the hit, I mean, it was generating so much noise on the server from CPU, that single index just uh, took care of it. So I could have scaled up and started paying more money, but as a DBA looking at say, saying who just rolled some new code that didn't have a proper index and boom, we create the index and we're back to normal. So that's where the monitoring and the baselining really comes in handy uh, for Azure SQL Database. So we covered what is SQL DB. We talked about the new features that were introduced in Azure first, things that it doesn't do. We created a database, we ran the D2 calculator, um, uh, talked about tuning differences and then showed a, a quick demo. And see, there's quite a few questions. I'll look at the, the last couple and then those that I didn't get to, I will uh, follow up. This is what's the best way to do a database backup from prod to dev using Azure, um, both being Azure SQL databases on different servers. So you can, um, let's see, within the same subscription, I know that there's ways of uh, being able to restore across subscriptions. Let me follow up with the, the actual uh, process from there, but from I haven't tried restoring within the tool from one server to a different server. Cause I think those are bound. So it may be the same process because there should be a better way than having to export and import you know, from a backpack. But let me follow up with uh, Nick with you on that. And then suppose I move a dev database. Is it possible to shut down the database on weekend for cost savings? Um, I guess not possible. Um, what are other options? So if you're standing up a database to, to do different testing, you can always revert it to the, the less expensive tier. Um, so as long as you fit within the parameters, so let's, let's say you're not over a terabyte, uh, then even if you're at a premium, you can drop it to a standard to the lowest uh, uh, vCore or DTU size to minimize the cost. Otherwise it's dropping the database and restoring it, which if you're in Azure SQL database, your databases stay out there in the uh, kind of the, the deleted state. Uh, let me see if I have one. Uh, maybe, maybe not um, uh, in, in my instance, but when I go to the server itself, so if I go and look at all of my resources, 
and I have a rad new database. So that's storage SQL Server. You have a deleted databases tab. And uh, I don't know if I really should, should be showing this or, or even recommending. So if I were to delete a database, it would be listed here during the retention period and then fall off. So theoretically, I guess you could delete the database, come back and then choose restore on that Monday morning. But what I would you know, suggest would be that your, your actual database, if it's in a, a, a higher standard or a premium tier, you can come into the uh, pricing tier, or is it now under configure? Yeah, so under configure, if it was in the, the premium, as long as the database size fits. So your standard, I think it's, let's see, from your S here, yeah, it can go up to a terabyte. So I'm at a S, what, three? I can't see, I'm not seeing where it is on my screen. Um, yeah, S3 here. So S3 can get up to a terabyte. You drop down to an S2, um, it can get up to 250 gig. So if you're over 250 gig, you would have to, the smallest you could go down to would be an S3. Uh, and then that goes up to a terabyte. So even if you're up in a premium, if you're less than a, a terabyte, which most people would be because you can't get up to four. Yeah, so your P6 is the highest you can go. As soon as, as, soon as you cross the, the P6, then you can get up to uh, the, the four terabyte. So again, you should be under the terabyte. You can always drop down to an S3 and then ramp back up. And you can even automate that through Azure Automation, through PowerShell to schedule that so you don't have to remember to do it. It's just, hey, Friday afternoon, 7 p.m., it's going to revert from a, a P4 down to an S3. Uh, so that's a, that's a good way of doing that. Let's see, if I have many databases that aren't, um, is there a way around the correlation issue if I have many databases that aren't? Yeah, you can set the correlation per database. So that, uh, Martin, that, that should answer that. I mean, you don't have to, to set the same when you go to create a database. Uh, we'll say add. From coalition, you can go in and type in um, uh, your your options here. Um, and from the management studio, I want to say when I, I choose to create database, uh, that it actually gives me the drop down for the coalition, so I can can pick and choose and don't have to copy paste or or type and, and possibly have a, a typo. So somebody asked, trace is not allowed. How about extended events? Yes, extended events have been supported since 20, uh, I want to say it's 2017, maybe late 2016, that extended events went GA. What's the recommendation for replacement of database mail? The only option is database mail. Uh, but from a, a uh, on-premises or Azure VM, you have event notifications, but you can't, uh, create a custom um, uh, event notification. So for if you need mail notifications, it's going to be um, either database mail through uh, on-premise Azure VM, or there may be some options within Azure Automation to call a, a different mail client. I haven't looked into that. But yeah, here through Management Studio, I mean, all of your coalitions are, are listed. So you could go and pick, you know, whatever it is that you need, and then your compat level. Uh, so if you have a, a bunch of databases, then you can you can specify one Z two Z. All right, um, we are well past three. So if there's any additional questions, I'll get those from the user group leader and then respond to those as. Uh, as I can, but I want to thank everyone for coming out. And if you have questions, um, let's see, I'll put this up. So uh, Tim at sqlskills.com or at tradney on Twitter. So thank you again for coming out. And I love talking about Azure. So just feel free to reach out. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. I think you, uh, I think you got to all the questions. So if you have any additional ones, email Tim or hit him up on Twitter. Uh, thank you again, Tim. Um, I'll get the recording cleaned up and posted tonight along with Tim's slide deck so you can go back over it whenever uh, you want. Thanks, everybody. See you next month.